This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 36 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad that you are joining us here on the Homestead Journey My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And as I record this podcast, it is Father's Day. It's Father's Day evening. So when this is released, it will be the day after Father's Day. But to all of you fathers, first and foremost, a happy, happy Father's Day. Um, I hope that it was a good one for you. And secondly, I just want to give a huge shout out to my father, to my dad. Um, I was very, very blessed to be able to spend some time with him today and so thankful for that. I don't take that for granted. And I think if there's anything good that has come out of this whole coronavirus thing, um, it's that I cherish the time with my mom and dad more so now, I think, than I did before. I'm going weeks without being able to spend time with them. Um, Really, really tore at me. And and quite frankly, it's kind of funny because I literally, for for a couple of years, we were all on different continents. Literally, my brothers were on one continent. We were on another continent. My mom and dad were in Brazil. uh, And I literally went years without seeing my mom and dad. Um. And so now it's one of those things where, you know, they're just up the road and sometimes you take that a little bit for granted. And yet this coronavirus thing has really reminded me to cherish every opportunity, every memory. And so I was very, very glad to be able to spend time with my dad today. My dad uh, and I have a great relationship. We, We work so well together and just have made so many great memories together. We share a lot of common interests from gardening to animal, just to a lot of things. And uh, my mom and dad are homesteaders. They preserve and harvest food. And so we talk a lot of the same language, but, but more, more than that, my dad um, raised me to, to love Jesus. I'm a Christian. Um, He raised me to have a strong faith in God, to love my family and to work hard. And he raised three boys like that. And obviously my mom had some to do with this. Don't get me wrong. (laughs) But I am just very, very blessed to have a father like that. To have a father that is not just a father, but he's a friend. And uh, so anyhow, dad, I love you. And um, was very, very blessed to be able to spend some time with you today. All right. Having said all of that mushy, gushy stuff, let's jump right on into this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to speed with what's been going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Well, it has been another great week here on the Homestead, although quite frankly, it has been very, very dry. We are having a very early (laughs) dog days of summer. Um, We are in, what, the third week of June, and already we are seeing temps in the 90s for a prolonged period of time, which for us is really hot really early. We haven't had much rain lately, so that kind of stinks, but the garden is still looking really, really nice, and we are continuing to enjoy vegetables from our garden. So this week we enjoyed some spinach, We've enjoyed a number of lettuce salads, and really a lot of things are coming on um, and and looking very, very nice. We switched over to drip irrigation this week. So I had been using my sprinkler system, but now that things have really started to grow, it becomes a lot more difficult for that water to penetrate down to the soil. And the other problem is that as the leaves get wet, you can start getting things like powdery mildew and funguses and things like that. So I have switched over to my drip irrigation system and I put everything on a pot, on a timer and that really, really has been a huge blessing. Um, I 
had really struggled when I was doing, and, and I could have put the sprinkler system on a timer, except for the fact that I needed to move my sprinkler because I only have one sprinkler. Uh, so I had to move it around within the square foot garden area, the raised bed garden area. Um, but I could have put it on a timer. But what I was finding is I would start my timer. If I remember to start my timer, it would go off and I'd be in the middle of a task and I would think, okay, I need to go shut that off, but I don't want to stop this task. And so I would turn off my alarm and then I would forget to go shut off my water. And I'm like, man, Brian, this is not good. You're going to run your well dry watering your garden. So I am very glad to have the drip irrigation going and have everything switched over to a timer. And the thing that was really, really nice is today we went up and spent the afternoon with my mom and dad and my garden got watered. The drip irrigation kicked in and then it shut off. So very, very happy with that so far. We'll see how things go. I'm trying to get it dialed in to know how often I need to run it, how long I need to run it, uh, but so far, so good. Another thing that's really, really exciting is that the marigolds that I had planted along the edge of some of my raised beds and along the edge of some of my uh, plots in the roost stout bed are starting to pop through. And uh, so very excited about that. Having some Flowers in the garden will be very, very nice. I, I should have planted them early, earlier, but uh, better late than never. So very excited to uh, to have those coming up. My potatoes are looking really great in the roost stout bed. In fact, I need to go through with some hay and hill them again, but they're looking great. And I also planted some bush beans in the roost stout bed and those have popped up. So all of that is very excited. Right now, I'm very, very happy with how the garden is looking. Now, my wife and I did spend some time out there weeding this week, and I'm just really finding that, again, as I shared last week, I think it was, I'm not going to say I like weeding, but I have really found an enjoyment just being out in the garden and spending some time, just no podcast going. I, I, I've not been listening to music or anything, just out there enjoying the sounds of the birds and the sights and the smells of the garden, and just enjoying the beauty of the homestead. Speaking of beauty on the homestead, I have put together some more window boxes. And so, uh, again, we've got some marigolds in there, some nas nasturnums. I can never say that correctly. But anyhow, some of those planted in there, and those are starting to pop up. So very excited about that. We put the brackets for those on the uh, side of the mobile chicken coop where those two window boxes are going to go. And I also did something else very fun. I had a metal uh, tray that came out of an old refrigerator that said fruit on the bottom of it. It's a metal bin and it said fruit on the side of it. And so I filled that with some dirt and I put some marigolds in that. And uh, so those have started to pop up. And then once those pop up really, really nicely, I'm going to take that and put it up on that sink in the garden. So again, really trying to create some beauty here on the homestead for us to enjoy. This week, we also did something that I've been wanting to do for a while, and that is we put in a legit herb garden. Now, it's a raised bed that I put together using some pallet material around here uh, that I had laying around here on the house, some pallets that I had deconstructed, and we planted some spearmint, peppermint, purple basil, parsley, oregano, thyme, rosemary, and chamomile in that. Now, those of you who are thinking, Brian, you shouldn't have planted peppermint and spearmint in that it's going to overrun the bed. What I did is I took some five-gallon buckets that had holes in the bottom of them. I cut the top of those buckets off, and I put those in the middle of the raised beds, and then I planted the peppermint and the spearmint in those buckets. So hopefully that will keep everything from spreading, keep the peppermint and the spearmint where it's supposed to be. Fingers crossed it's going to work. But the really cool thing about this whole situation is that I found these herbs on Facebook Marketplace. Now I had started some herbs of my own. Some of them I gave away. Some of them I didn't water as well as I should have and I lost them. And so I went out and I bought herbs. And I found this lady on Facebook Marketplace, reached out to her, found that she was here local. And wouldn't you know, but she happened to live at a house that I drive by very, very frequently. And I've always admired her gardens. She has beautiful, beautiful gardens. She has blueberries and she has fruit. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place. 
And so when I got there and I realized where it was, I asked her for a garden tour and she was more than happy to provide me with a garden tour. And I probably spent over an hour there. Now we were wearing masks. Okay. So uh, we, we tried to, to practice a social distancing thing, but it was just so cool to be able to make a contact with somebody. There have been times when I was tempted just to stop and just walk up and knock on the door and say, hey, I love your gardens. I'm a gardener myself. I'd love if you have time to see, and, but I didn't have to do that. <laughs> I, I was there to pick up these plants and so had just a really awesome time talking to her and have invited her to come up here and see what we've got going on. And so that was just something very, very exciting. Uh, this week I also broke down and I bought some kiddie pools for the ducks and the geese and they are loving them. And I probably should have done that a long, long time ago, but uh, we got a pool for the older ducks and geese and, and another one for the younger ones and they're just out there having an absolute blast. The last thing I wanted to share with you is something that didn't go so well this week here on the homestead. And that is that one of my pig waterers ran dry. And it happened to be the waterer where I have most of my pigs. The problem with that waterer is it sits about 15 to 20 feet inside the paddock. So I can't check it from where I usually feed the pigs. And it's one of those things that when I am feeding my pigs, generally speaking, I'm either on my way to work or on my way home from work. And so it's not really conducive for me to climb over the fence and go down and check that barrel to make sure that it has water in it. What I have is one of those 55 gallon blue barrels with a, water, a nipple at the bottom so that they can drink out of it. And it ran dry. And I have no idea how long it was dry. But what I do know is that those pigs, when I started putting water in there and I gave them access to water, they went absolutely berserk. And so what I have done is I have built something that hopefully will help me be able to see the level of the water in that from a distance. And so I'm putting together a video. It's going to be going up on our YouTube page. So you're going to want to jump over to YouTube and check us out there, like and subscribe, uh, click the bell so that you're notified when that video goes live and you will be able to see my homestead hack job, <laughs> as Brian J calls them, on how I hopefully will never ever let that happen again. Thankfully, all the pigs seem to be okay and I didn't lose any, but uh, when I realized what had happened, I was very, very scared. Um, uh, because I didn't want to lose a pig, but I was also kicking myself that I let something that basic get past me. And so hopefully this homestead hack will help that, uh, keep that from happening again. All right. Well, that is this week's homestead happenings. Let's jump on over to charting the course. For this week's episode, I actually had something totally different planned. I, I, I had some ideas that I had been kind of chewing on for the last couple of weeks. And then we had something happen here locally uh, this past Thursday that really got me to thinking that I needed to change course. So the episode that I had plenty, had planned for today, we will push off to a further date. But I just really felt like I needed to switch gears. What happened on Thursday is that a local farmer had an accident where she somehow got stuck in a hay baler. And she was stuck so badly into the hay baler that they actually had to fly in surgeons to surgically remove her from the hay baler out in the field. And basically what that is, it's a kind way to say they had to amputate her arm in order to extract her from that piece of farm equipment. Now, this certainly is not the first time that I've been aware of a farming accident. Um, unfortunately, my family has been directly affected by this. When I was younger, I had two cousins, one on my uh, paternal grandmother's side and one on my paternal grandfather's side, uh, pass away in farming accidents. Um, a good friend of mine passed away from a farming accident in 2018 when some cows kind of went nuts, knocked him over, and he sustained a head injury. 
uh, a good friend of mine from church. I work with him. His father-in-law passed away in a farming accident last fall. So this certainly was not the first time that I have heard of or been aware of a farming accident. But it really, really got me to thinking about how dangerous this lifestyle can be. And I think sometimes we fail to recognize that as we are sharing with people how awesome this lifestyle is, and it certainly is, and how lovely this lifestyle is, and it certainly is that, and how great of a lifestyle it is to live. And yes, it is that. But there are also dangers that come along with this lifestyle. Did you know that two of the top 25 most dangerous jobs in the United States are farming related? In fact, it is more dangerous to be a farmer than it is to be a police officer or a firefighter. Now, this is according to an article that was published on usatoday.com. I'll link to it in the show notes. But farming is a very, very dangerous occupation. Now, I know there's a lot of debate over whether or not homesteading constitutes farming or where does homesteading stop and farming start. But the fact of the matter is we do a lot of the same things that people do even in big ag. We might do it on a smaller scale, but we're using, if not the same equipment, a lot of similar equipment. We're involved in a lot of similar things, and there's just a lot of risk on our homesteads. And it's not just risk to us, but it's also risk to our children. Uh, I was reading an article on rural mutual insurance, uh, on the rural mutual insurance site, and I'll say that five times uh, fast. I'll provide a link to this also in the show notes. It's ruralmutual.com. And according to their stats, one child dies in an ag-related incident every three days. 33 children are seriously injured every day on farms. Tractors cause 40% of accidental farm deaths of children under 15. And more than half of young children injured on the farm were not working, but were bystanders or playing in the wrong spot at the wrong time. So, folks, it's not just that we as homesteaders are at risk, but if we're not careful, our children are also at risk. Now, according again to Rural Mutual's website, the top causes of fatal ag injuries are machinery, motor vehicles, including ATVs, and drowning. And the top causes of non-fatal ag injuries are falls, animals, and machinery slash vehicles. Now, when you stop and think about it, you think about the equipment that we use as homesteaders, the activities that we're involved in. We're involved in or we use a lot of equipment that many people who live in urban and suburban areas don't ever touch. Things like tractors, ATVs, power tools, small engine equipment like lawnmowers, weed whackers, and chainsaws, heat lamps and water defrosters, chicken pluckers, scalders, butchering knives, and the list could go on and on. We're involved in activities that many people who live in urban and suburban areas aren't involved in. We do a lot of DIY projects, animal husbandry, food preservation, and again, the list could go on and on. And all of those activities within them, there are inherent risks. All of these things, the equipment, the activities, They carry a certain level of risk. And so certainly we, I'm not suggesting that we need to wrap ourselves up in bubble wrap, (laughs) but we need to manage the risks as best we can to ensure that we, that our families, we don't become yet another statistic. So on this episode, I want to spend some time thinking about some of the things that cause that can lead to ag-related or to homesteading-related injuries and even death, and then talk about some ways, some strategies, some things that we might want to think about on our homesteads to mitigate those risks. The first thing that comes to my mind, the first cause of some injuries on the homestead is simply ignorance. 
And I don't mean that in an insulting or a demeaning way. I simply mean that from the standpoint of you don't know what you don't know. And right now we have a lot of people who are coming into this lifestyle who have never been around this equipment. They've never run a tractor in their life. They've never run a chainsaw. They've never ridden on a, you know, some people have never even ridden on a, on a riding lawnmower. So there's a lot of people that are coming into this lifestyle and they're not used to using or being around this equipment. There's also a lot of people who are trying to do a lot of DIY projects. And again, they don't know all of the, the proper ways to use tools, the proper ways to wire things, the proper ways to put things together. There's just a lack of knowledge because people didn't grow up around this. They didn't grow up doing this. We have a lot of people who are starting to learn how to preserve food, and I think that's awesome. But if you don't preserve food correctly, you can sicken and you could even kill somebody. So, Ignorance, not knowing what you don't know, can cause injury. It can even cause death. The next thing that comes to my mind is carelessness. Carelessness can lead to injury and even death. Sometimes what happens is people have used this equipment for years and years and years and years, and they lose respect for the machinery. They start taking shortcuts. They start thinking, well, I got away with it last time. Can I push the boundaries even further? Sometimes we're just in a hurry to get things done. There's only so many hours in the day, so many days in the week, so many weeks in a month, and so on and so forth. We're hurry, 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 hurry. I've got to get it done. I've got to get it done. I've got to get it done. And sometimes because of that, we make careless decisions that can cause us a finger, an eye, an arm, or it could even cause us a life. Sometimes carelessness is simply that we're not aware of our surroundings. We forget that there's something behind us. We forget that there's someone behind us. We forget that there's a knoll that breaks one way or the other. We're not aware of our surroundings. So not only do ignorance and carelessness cause injury and sometimes death, but also well, I see a lot of people who bypass safety equipment or remove guards from machinery. You know, sometimes I, I hear of people who take the pressure switches that are on lawnmower seats that are supposed to keep, you know, if, if you get off the seat, then the lawnmower engine cuts out. And sometimes people, they don't weigh enough or they're having their kids mow and their kids don't weigh enough. And so it doesn't hold down enough pressure. And so people will bypass that safety switch. But what happens if your kid falls off the lawnmower and it keeps going? Or you fall off the lawnmower and it keeps going? I know of people that that's happened to. Sometimes people will remove the deck guards on lawnmowers. It's inconvenient. That deck guard that it sticks out and it's banging into stuff. And so they'll just take it off. See, people remove the guards on grinders or other power tools. And I get it. Sometimes you've got a hand grinder. You're trying to get it into a spot, and that guard's in the way. And maybe you decide, okay, it's an acceptable risk to remove that guard so I can get it in there. But if you're going to do that, at least put the guard back on. But people will take the guards off. How about this one? Cutting off the grounding plug on electrical cords so that it will fit into, a, I take a three-prong and fit it into a, a two-prong. Not good, folks. Not good. Or rollover protection system on tractors, ROPS. And I see so many people, and I've done this. I'll be honest with you. Driving around, and your ROPS is folded down. It's not good. Getting on your tractor and not putting the seatbelt on. Keep in mind that one of the Leading causes of ag-related injury and death are tractor rollovers. And so if you don't have the ROPS up, you don't have a seatbelt on, that tractor rolls over, you're going to get thrown, crushed. It's not good. If you've got a tractor with rollover protection system, put it up. Put your seatbelt on. But a lot of times people bypass the safety equipment 
or they remove the guards. Number four, failing to wear the proper PPE, personal protective equipment, safety glasses, such a simple thing. And yet many times because we're in a hurry, we're careless and we say, well, I'm just going to cut this one board. And so we do the old safety squeeze. You know, we squeeze our eyes or the safety squint and we go ahead and cut that board without safety glasses. Or we run a chainsaw without hearing protection or a weed whacker without hearing protection or a lawnmower without hearing protection. I see so many people, so many YouTubers out doing things and they don't have proper footwear. Now, I, I'm, I'm all about comfort, folks. I love being comfortable. But wear the proper footwear. If you're going to be out doing stuff, wear the proper footwear. Another big one is running a chainsaw without having a pair of chaps. You get that chainsaw and it kicks the wrong way and you don't have chaps on, not a pretty, pretty situation. Another big one I see is people who use ATVs around their farm or their homestead and they're just going to jump on it and ride over there, just going to ride down to the mailbox or whatever, and they don't put a helmet on. Folks, failing to wear the proper PPE can certainly lead to injury and death. Another thing I see happen, and sometimes I'm guilty of this too, <laughs> so trust me on this folks when I say I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you, but we try to use the wrong tool for the job. You know, using a sledgehammer to try to drive fence posts, um, using a tractor in ways that it's not meant to be, or using it to lift things more than it's recommended capacity or maybe we try to rig things up and we're using either the wrong size of rope and chain it's undersized or maybe it's the wrong kind of rope and chain and yet we're going to try to rig things up and then we risk those things breaking and maybe somebody getting crushed by a falling load or when that breaks that chain or that rope smacking into somebody or smacking into something and causing property damage. So we're using the wrong tool for the job. I've also seen people who are using, you know, they need to get up somewhere. They don't have a, an extension ladder that's long enough. And so they will take a step ladder and put it in a bucket and then raise the bucket and climb up. Uh, you, you've seen the pictures, folks. <laughs> the wrong tool for the job. Another thing that can cause injury on your homestead is a messy storage and work area. And I'll tell you right now, folks, I am really, really bad about this. Really, really bad about this. Trip hazards, you know, you're jumping over this to get to that, to get to the other thing. Trip hazards, slip hazards, power cords kind of running all over. Maybe you've got a power cord going to a power strip, and then from the power strip, you've got multiple power cords going off. You know what I'm talking about. But messy storage and work areas. And then the last thing, and certainly this is not a comprehensive list, but the last thing that came to my mind was poor animal husbandry. And what do I mean by that? Keeping mean animals on your homestead, aggressive animals on your homestead can certainly lead to injury and it can even lead to death. And then not understanding how animals, well, act. If you don't understand that sows can be territorial, that boars can be territorial, and you put animals in the wrong situations or the wrong paddocks or you try to put maybe two boars uh, that don't know each other together in the same paddock, you can create a very toxic situation that can be very, very dangerous. And if you try to get in there and then try to break up the scrum, <laughs> break up the scrap, you can end up getting injured yourself. So poor animal husbandry, poor selection from the standpoint of uh, you know animal type or size, all of those things can lead 
to injury and even death on your homestead. Now, again, this certainly is not a comprehensive list and every homestead is unique and you may not have a tractor. And so all of the tractor things that I talked about, well, maybe they just don't apply to you, but every homestead has risk. And so you need to think about if there are some things that I missed, then you need to make sure that you add those to your list. And if there are things that maybe you think I should have talked about, send me an email, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net, and I will be glad to talk about them in a future episode. But folks, I don't want to just leave you there and say, okay, well, these are all of the things that could go bad, and this is all of the ways that a homestead can be dangerous, because they don't have to be dangerous. There are things that we can do as homesteaders to make sure that we homestead safely. So first of all, let's go with number one. How do we deal with ignorance? Again, you don't know what you don't know. And so to me, I think the best way for you to deal with an ignorance problem is to learn as much as you can from a trusted expert. And this is where I'm going to maybe get myself into a little bit of a hot, of hot water. But when I talk about a trusted app expert, yes, YouTube is great and blogs are great and Facebook groups are great. But you need to be very, very careful who you are taking advice from. Just because someone has a large YouTube following does not an expert make. Just because Brian from upstate New York has a podcast does not an expert make. Just because Joe Blow from Idaho has a blog does not an expert make. And so I just want to caution you with regards to internet-based and I'm using huge air quotes here, experts that you know for certain that they know what the heck they're talking about. You know, one of the big ones is, is food preservation. I'm a member of, of a number, probably too many homesteading groups. I'm a member of a number of canning groups. And I see people give horrible, horrible, horrible advice on some of those canning groups, telling people that they can hot water bath low acid vegetables, that they can hot water bath um, meat. That's a horrible idea. That can be very, very dangerous. Now, certainly you may do it, you may get away with it, and that's great, but you're playing Russian roulette. It's bad, bad advice. So you need to be careful that you are learning from trusted experts. Look in your area for people that have a certification in food preservation and take a food preservation course from them. There are also food preservation courses online through people who are certified in home food preservation. So learn the basics from them and then figure out where you can bend the rules, where you know what the risk is, okay? But learn from trusted experts, not Joe Blow in Idaho with a blog. Now, as I mentioned before, tractor-related accidents are one of the number one causes of injury and death on a, on a farm. And so if you have bought a tractor for your homestead, you may want to look into attending some kind of tractor safety course. Now, here locally, they offer them periodically at our local fairground through, I think it's Cornell Cooperative Extension. But sometimes some of the uh, tractor dealers will offer them. But uh, you may want to, especially if you do not grow up around tractors, you may want to look into a tractor safety course or an ATV safety course. But if there is a safety course related to whatever piece of equipment is that you have on your homestead, you may want to consider going through that course or having your kids go through that course so that they know how to safely use that equipment. Your community college might also offer adult continuing education that can help you in, in a lot of those areas, whether it's food preservation or how to run a tractor or just so many things that would have a safety component. And finally, you can find yourself a trusted mentor. 
And when I say a trusted mentor, I'm talking about somebody who isn't cutting corners, who isn't, you know, driving around with all the guards off, um, but somebody who understands and appreciates safety on a farm or on a homestead. But not only can you learn from trusted experts, you can also learn from other people's mistakes. And so when you hear of stories like someone who gets their arm caught in a baler, and I'm not poking fun at that lady, I, I'm not. Please don't misunderstand me. But what I am saying is that we need to learn from her mistake that if we're out bailing hay, we don't put our arms in the baler. So learn from other people's mistakes. Every year, it seems like I hear of a story of a barn that burnt to the ground because people had heat lamps in their barn. Let's learn from those mistakes and limit or get rid of heat lamps altogether. How can we deal with carelessness? Well, we can respect the machinery that we're running. We don't take it for granted. We don't try to push it beyond its limits. We won't take shortcuts. Even if it means that we've got to get down off the tractor and move something, we're going to do that. We're going to be aware of our surroundings and make sure that our kids understand the importance of not being where they're not supposed to be. That we take time to teach our kids about the dangers of machinery, of water, of animals, etc., etc., etc. So how can we deal with the issue of bypassing safety equipment or removing guards? <laughs> Easy one. Don't do it. Now, I also understand that there are times when it may be necessary. Maybe you have a grinder, you're trying to get into a, a tight spot, the guard's in the way, and so you make the decision that you're going to take that guard off, even though it may not be a great idea, but it's just a practical thing that you're going to do. Now, I'm not recommending this, okay? But if you take it off, when you're done, put it back on. Don't run it forever and ever and ever more with no guard on it. Don't bypass safety equipment. If your kid is riding the lawnmower and they're not heavy enough to keep that seat down, then maybe they shouldn't be operating that lawnmower. Put the rollover protection system up on your tractor. If you can, leave it up. But if not, put it up every time you use it and wear your seatbelt. That's something that I'm trying to remind myself Wear your seatbelt, Brian. Wear your seatbelt. Failing to wear the proper PPE. And again, folks, on one hand, this is simple, and yet it's sometimes inconvenient. The fact is, we don't always have the safety glasses where we should have the safety glasses. But wear your safety glasses. If that means that you've got to get five or six pairs of safety glasses and store them in different places around your homestead and maybe keep a pair on your tractor and a pair in your truck and a pair in your car, then do that. It's much cheaper to buy safety glasses than it is to deal with the surgery on an eye where you've got a piece of metal in it or a piece of wood in it or even losing an eye all together. So wear proper PPE. If you're going to ride an ATV, Put a helmet on. Wear helmets. Yes, I know they're hot. I know that they're sometimes uncomfortable, but wear your helmet. Wear proper footwear. If you're working with things that could fall on your toe and injure them, don't be wearing flip flops. Actually, flip flops are a bad idea, in my opinion, just about anywhere on the homestead. Uh, to me, I, I think flip flops are a horrible, horrible invention. Um, I, I guess if you're wearing them to go into the shower at a public rest area or you're maybe using them to walk down to the water's edge to put a kayak in, okay, I'll give you a pass on your flip-flops. But in general, flip-flops are bad footwear. All right, that's my opinion. But anyhow, on the homestead, though, make sure you're wearing the right footwear. Don't be wearing Crocs when you're putting up fence. All right, wear proper footwear. Use the right tools. For the job. If you're going to put in T posts, get a T post, uh, what do you call it? A T post pounder. Don't use a sledgehammer. Get a T post pounder. They're not that expensive. They work much better. 
have the right tool for the job. If you don't have it and you don't want to buy it, see if you can rent it. See if you can borrow it. You know, again, it, it, I know a lot of times we're in a hurry. You want to, don't want to deal with all of that stuff. But folks, taking the time to get the right tool for the job is going to be much better than taking the time to take a trip to the hospital because you hurt yourself. Know the limits of your machinery and work within those parameters. Don't try to lift too much for your tractor. Don't try to uh, pull too much for the chain that you're using. Know the limits of your machinery and of your tools. This one's a huge going edge for me. <laughs> but clean up your messy storage area and work areas. I have a horrible, horrible habit of getting project done and just dropping the tools and moving on to the next tool, next job. And then not only do I not know where the tool is when I go to need it, but I'm tripping over it. Uh, I, I've got a piece of lumber that I'm stumbling over. Make sure that you've got clean, as clean as possible. I'm not asking for pristine. <laughs> I'm not coming with a white glove, but try to avoid trip hazards and slip hazards. Clean your areas up, organize them. I'm going to be spending some time this week in my garage cleaning and organizing because I'm tired of this. All right, so you hold me accountable. If I don't come back and talk about that next week, you hold me accountable and send me an email and say, Brian, did you clean up your garage? Okay? <laughs> don't overload your power. All right? Don't have uh, the cords going all over because you're going to be tripping over them, but then don't go from a power cord to a, a power strip to 15 power cords. All right. Bad, bad, bad idea. And finally, let's talk a little bit about animal husbandry. Don't keep aggressive or mean animals on your homestead. Now, sometimes you may be trying to raise them out for meat, and I get that, but folks, you're playing with fire. And eventually you're going to get burnt. Especially if you have kids on your homestead. Don't keep aggressive or mean animals around. Put them in the freezer. Put them on the plate. And I know sometimes it's hard. You have a rooster that you absolutely love. Then he becomes very, very aggressive. Don't keep him around. Number one, you don't want to keep him around because he could hurt you. But number two, you don't want him breeding and passing those aggressive traits on to his offspring. So don't keep aggressive or mean animals around and certainly don't breed those animals. But also you need to respect and understand how they act. If you put a boar, a new boar, right next door to another boar, they are going to try to get through the fence and fight. And if they do... Don't get in there and try to figure it out. Let nature run its course. Because if you get in there, you are playing with fire. And when you've got two boars that are fighting and you try to get between them, they don't care whether who they're taking a pound of flesh out of. They will bite you, tromp on you, and potentially even kill you. Uh, same thing with a boar going after a sow that's in heat. If they've broken through the fence... You've lost that battle, folks. Don't lose the war. <laughs> it's much better to have an unwanted pregnancy than to have an unwanted trip to the hospital. So let me just end this segment by asking you these questions. When is the last time you thought specifically about safety on your homestead? When is the last time you sat down and had a conversation with your wife, your husband, your significant other, or your kids about safety? I want to see your homestead journey be a beautiful one, a beautiful one for you, for your family, for your friends. I don't want to see it marred by injury, disfigurement, or even death. So homestead safely, my friends. I'd really love to keep you as an audience member for a really, really long time. Well, folks, that is it for this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. If you have found this helpful, I would really appreciate it if you would share it with other people that you think may need to hear this message of homestead safety. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please make sure that you have subscribed on your favorite 
podcast platform, whether it's Google, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, uh, or you can subscribe through the homesteadjourney.net, our website. If you have any comments or questions about today's show, you can reach out to us via our social media accounts. All of the links are in the show notes. Or you can reach me directly, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. Also, keep in mind that I am going to be releasing a video this week on our YouTube channel, so make sure that you have subscribed over there. You're not going to want to miss that. As always, the music on this program is provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.